Hi, so my name is Pixie. I am Captain Corey's mum, um, also known as the Crap Goth, which he so fondly calls me, and I also am his crewmate in all of his videos. Today, today is a difficult one. So I am going to be talking about um, some sensitive topics. So um, if you don't want to hear about anything to do with medical cases with children, um, end of life care and um, things which could be distressing, don't watch this video. Um, this is an informational video and is a bit of a backstory for Corey to explain to people um, about Corey's history, how he, he kind of got where he is now, why we're going through what we are going through with him and why decisions have been made. So it's not going to be very nice to talk about. It's going to be quite difficult for me as a mum, but it's one that I feel is so important. And the main thing for me today is to not only explain Corey's story, but is to also try and advocate for child transplantation, adult transplantation and the importance of giving after you've gone, which is a very sensitive subject. So again, if it's not something that you want to hear, then please feel free to just skip over this and then carry on with the other videos, which would be positive and happy. But for now, here goes. At 20 weeks pregnant, Corey was diagnosed with a condition called hyperplastic left heart syndrome. Now this can happen um, with hyperplastic right heart and hyperplastic left heart. Corey had the left heart, which means that the left side of his heart was severely underdeveloped. Um, so only the right side of the heart was functioning. This is a really serious and life-threatening condition that cannot be cured, um, but it can be treated um, with three stages of surgery called the Norwood, the Glen and the Fontan completion, which quite often can see children once they've had these surgeries through to adulthood, teenage years, you know, it's each child is very, very different. And we were on that journey with Corey. So he was born in a controlled labour um, at 38 weeks and pretty much straight away was taken from me and put into the neonatal intensive care unit where he thrived for the first probably 24 hours until he was needed assistance with his breathing and then was taken off to have his first open heart surgery at just a couple of days old. Um, it was a hard time. I think anybody who is going on this journey with a hyperplastic baby, um, you should prepare yourself that it is not an easy journey, but one that is so rewarding and you will find a whole heart family around you, both online and you will meet other parents in hospital who are in exactly the same position as you. So it can seem a very scary journey, but please know that you are not alone. There is help out there. There is information out there. Um, and there are other people who are going through exactly the same as what you are. Um, and just don't shut anybody out. I think is the big thing is open yourself up to friendships and information. Don't Google everything because there are so many horror stories out there. So if anybody is pregnant with a hyperplastic child, um, it is scary, but it's also the most fantastic, wonderful journey you will ever find yourselves on because these children are incredible. They are resilient. They are amazing. And you will make friends with the most beautiful amount of people you could possibly imagine. These children are incredible. So don't lose hope is my first message to you all. So Corey's story was he had the first stage of surgery, which was the Norwood. Um, you can actually Google what this is because I can sit here and reel off all of the medical spiel, but it probably won't mean anything to you whatsoever. So the best thing you can probably do is in this in this instance is to Google the Norwood surgery for hyperplastic children. Um, Corey had this um, and then he had the second one, which is the Glen. He had that when he was about six months old. And then usually a child would go through to the Fontaine completion. Um, unfortunately, Corey was not able to have this. And this was about five years old. Um, we were told that Corey probably would not survive the surgery for this. His heart just wasn't strong enough. And that's when they told us that Corey was going to be listed potentially for a heart transplant. Now, that was the first thing that we had ever heard about it at all. We didn't even know a hyperplastic child would need a heart transplant at this point. It's not something that was ever raised with us. Um, we had a lot of information from um, Little Hearts Matter, which is a fantastic charity here in the UK um, that are full of knowledge. They were full of amazing people who were there to guide us and to kind of give us information leaflets and things. 
but we didn't know about transplantation being an option. So that came as a massive, massive shock to us. Um, it also meant that for the next two years, um, Corey was going backwards and forwards from where we live in the UK to up north um, to Newcastle, which is one of the leading hospitals. Um, we chose to go to Newcastle over London just because we had some friends who lived up north and we thought it might be a better place to have a support network. And also um, the Freeman Hospital, which is where Corey had his surgeries, um, are one of the best in the world. They are just amazing people. And we know people who have gone there previously. So that's why we made the decision to go there rather than Great Ormond Street, which is also a fantastic hospital, but it was just better for our circumstances. Obviously, for yourselves, if you're in the UK and you're following our journey and you find yourself in this position, you have to do what is right for you. Work out where your family base is going to be. Work out where you're going to stay. Um, quite a lot of the time, there is parent accommodation available at the hospitals. But um, sometimes um, for family who want to come and visit, that's not always possible. So it's just for us, it worked out better. Um, so that's why we made that decision. So... It took a couple of years of Corey to have a lot of tests. There was um, tests to do with his breathing, his stamina, and just so many in-depth trials that he had to go through, really, to make sure that he was a candidate for transplantation, which he was. Um, and that was a relief, but also obviously extremely scary, as you can imagine. Um, so we prepared ourselves to be put onto the list. So they said that Corey, although he was in heart failure and he'd been in heart failure his entire life, um, he was very cyanosed, which means that he had a blue tinge mostly around his lips and his fingernails were, were quite blue as well. He would get very breathless, wouldn't be able to walk up the stairs, never really went to school because he was just too tired. Um, but he was put on the casual list because he was managing quite well with that at home. And he was listed just after Christmas in 2017. Um, and then in 2018, we got the call just days after being listed, really, um, that he was going to be um, given a new heart. And that came out of the blue <laughs> and was scary. And within a several hours, the hospital had sent hospital transport to pick up Corey, myself, and then his baby sister, Ostara, who was a little baby at that point, and we all went off to the hospital um, in a special ambulance. And my husband, my now husband, my then partner, um, followed us up a few hours later. And that was an incredibly emotional journey. I remember having Ostara in her baby seat on one side of me in the back of this ambulance car and Corey on the other side in his seat and just holding his hand thinking, oh my gosh, like, is this the last time I'm going to be with him, what is going to happen, we didn't know what to expect, so that was quite a difficult journey um, um, and when we got there um, everyone was just so beautiful and so welcoming. So we got to the hospital and um, there was a lot of forms to be filled in, there was nurses who were fantastic with us, Corey was nil by mouth for a while because he knew we had to go for surgery he was little, so he didn't really understand what was going on, apart from the fact he was about to have a magic heart put in his body that was going to make him so much better. So as a mum, I remember having Ostara in my arms because she was a very small baby back then. Um, and just trying to reassure Corey as much as I could that this was a magical adventure and he was going to be so much better after it. And obviously it worked quite well with him being so little because he didn't understand actually what was going to happen to him. Um... But I fast forwarded that, he went in for surgery, um, the operation lasted several hours and obviously I was sat around worrying and crying and as, as all parents do, you know, you sit around and you just fret and the nurses were rallying around us and it just, you know, me and Ostara and I was felt really blessed that I had her actually to cradle and she was a breastfed baby so I was able to, to kind of give her nourishment and cuddles and kind of focus on her for a little while which kind of helped with the coping mechanisms of Corey being in surgery. And then John, um, who's now my husband, then partner, came up and he um, stayed with us, which was fantastic. So, and the, the operation went really well. So Corey was in surgery for several hours and when he came out, um, he went straight to the intensive care unit um, where he, he was doing very, very well. I mean, there's nothing which can prepare you, to be honest with you, with seeing your child with their chest open 
um, covered in machinery and wires on a ventilator. Um, they kind of prepare you mentally for this thing before it happens. But I think seeing your child in that position is really hard and you don't know when they're going to wake up and you don't know what if they're in pain or anything like that but the staff were incredible the nurses the specialists everybody was so incredibly supportive and that makes it easier because you are so comforted with the fact that they are looking after your child to the best of their abilities and they are at the top of their field so that went really well Corey did reject actually um whilst he was recovering but he went and had um special treatment done and then he was able to come back from that because it was a cellular rejection um and then after about six months in hospital Corey was able to come home which was incredible and honestly the difference in him oh it was just beautiful to see so for the first time in his life his he, he was his skin was flushed and he didn't have the blue lips and the blue nails and he was happy and he was full of energy and he would smile and and obviously it took a long time to recover and we were in in kind of in isolation for, for quite a long time because when you have a transplant i think the misconception is the fact that you have a transplant um, and suddenly you're magically okay you're fixed so that isn't the case when you have a transplant of any kind so you have a transplant and then you go off to the hospital for probably every week for a few weeks then every two weeks and three weeks and it goes on you're having treatment and blood tests and scans and and all kinds of things just to check that everything's okay and Corey was having this done regularly so um, it became a regular thing to go to Newcastle and it was nice to see everybody because it was a bit like having a second family up there um, and it was a nice to know that Corey was doing so well which he did really well for and he was so well that he was able to start school for the first time in his life which was a huge huge deal for us and for Corey because he'd never done it before and he was so excited about this new chapter in his life. Unfortunately, that joy only lasted for a few months. And in 2019, Corey actually went into multiple organ failure and full heart block. Um, and he ended up in intensive care and fighting for his life. And we were told at that point then that Corey was so sick that he had about 12 hours to live. So um, we had a chaplain come and bless him, which I'm pagan personally, um, I don't disbelieve in any kind of God whatsoever, I am completely open but me personally I'm pagan so um, there was it was just a nice kind of compromise for everybody um, so we had Corey blessed um, and I got into bed with him that night, they drew the curtains around us um, and they fully expected Corey to pass away in my arms and I just remember staying awake for as long as I could and just watching him, studying his, his eyebrows and his little eyelashes and holding his hands. And then after staying up all night with him and hearing him struggle to breathe, I whispered in his ears that it was OK to go. And then I fell asleep holding him and I woke up and he was still there. He was fighting and he just proved beyond all odds that he was going nowhere. He was a stubborn Corey that we all know and love now. And, and that was it. Then everybody kind of rallied around and said, right, we're going to fight for him now. So they managed to stabilise him for about a month until he was able to be transferred from Birmingham Children's Hospital, which is where all this had happened, um, back up to Newcastle Freeman, um, where he was, he was admitted to the intensive care unit and was given an extremely good care. Um, he seemed to be making a good recovery. He was able to do a BBC Two documentary called Stories of Us. Um, which he participated in, I participated in, he was laughing with the clown doctors and it seemed to be that things were going great. Um, but unfortunately, a few days later, um, Corey's heart began rejecting again and his body shut down. And I was told that the only way he would survive was to have a second heart transplant, which was a massive shock. And that was my call then. Whether do I then put my son through this again? Um... And my choice then was, yes, I'm going to go for this. I can't not let him go. I can't I can't let him go, should I say. I didn't want him to leave me. And he was so young and he deserved this second chance. So we went for it again. So I went for a second transplant. Um, and this one was far more complicated. Um, so before the transplant could take place, Corey was placed on VADS. He had a Berlin heart attached, which is an artificial machine. Um, I 
we'll pop some photos up onto Corey's Transplant page to show this. So anybody who is following Corey's Transplant page on Facebook um, can go on there and there will be some photos on there, but they will be graphic. So again, a disclaimer that it could be a trigger warning for you. So if you don't like that kind of thing, please don't look. Um, but it was an extremely painful process for Corey to have these vads in. I'm not going to go into massive detail, but they were um, very painful, very invasive, and he was attached to a lot of machinery. He was on a ventilator and everything, so he was so distressed that he actually did write down on a little whiteboard at one point, um, please let me die. <sighs> now, as a mum, having your child write that is horrendous awful and it makes me feel made me feel guilty for putting him through that um and we didn't actually tell him he was going to have another transplant um until the surgeons actually came when they found a heart for him a second heart which was a miracle and they took him to theater um but he was quite out of it anyway so he really doesn't he wasn't really aware of what was going to happen to him and so off he went again for his second miracle. So Corey had his second transplant and he came out and just to cut a long story short, he was in hospital for about six months. Um, he had been in a coma for so long prior to being um, transplanted and he was so poorly. He was unable to eat, so he was extremely skinny. He had to have a tracheostomy fitted. So you will notice on Corey's videos, he has a tracheostomy scar. Um, his hole is actually still open a little bit. So every now and then, if he coughs, you might hear him whistle. Um, but he had that to help him breathe. So obviously I had to be trained in how to um, kind of suction him and things like that when he obviously needed it, which was not a very nice thing for me, not a very nice thing for him. Um, but he had to learn to walk again. He had to learn to talk without a tracheostomy and he had to need to breathe. Um, it was just a very long process and it was extremely traumatic for Corey. Um, now, I don't regret him having it done because it's given him an extra two years with us, which I will go into. Um, but at that time, I was going basing my experience on his first transplant. So his second one was completely different to the first. It was it was very hard. It was very emotionally traumatic for Corey. It was very painful for Corey. And there was a lot of surgery involved, not just one, but there were several surgical things that he needed doing. So Corey was complicated. Not all children who need a second transplant or a third transplant would be the same as this. So please do not base Corey's experience on anything that is going to influence your decision to put your child through a second transplant should they need it. This is every child is different. So all I can say is just you go with what you think is best for your child. You above anybody else know what your child can can cope with and what they can't cope with. And I thought that Corey could cope with this. Unfortunately, I was wrong in this instance. And um, although he did survive the transplant um, and he came home after several months, we came home during the middle of COVID. So COVID struck up whilst Corey was in hospital. So everything that I'd been promising him for all that time, kind of going to parks, you're going to be able to go back to Whitby, North Yorkshire, which is his favourite place in the world. He loves going there. Um, he came home to COVID being rife. So we were isolating pretty much from 2019 when we went into hospital until this year. Obviously, we're now in 2023 and we've only just started kind of branching out and going out um, like towards the back end of last year. So it's a long time that we've been at home and um, trying to keep Corey safe, basically. But unfortunately, a few months ago, um, Corey started school again and picked up a bug, which... Um, knocked his immune system and he went back into organ failure and ended up in intensive care again. This time he went to Leicester Hospital. He was there for a month with me and then he got moved on to Newcastle. And I was so relieved when we got to Newcastle. Leicester took extremely good care of him. He was on um, dialysis machines. His body was so overloaded with fluid because he's in kidney failure as well as heart failure. Um, so they had to strip all the excess fluid off of him. And he was in a lot of pain with that as well but they stabilized him again they did say i could lose him but he again he fought because he's a tough little cookie um they got him to newcastle they did um what is called a cardiac catheter so they um, went in to investigate his heart to see um how how that was functioning 
And when they came out, um, I was so full of positivity because they've always saved him before. You know, they've always said, look, you know, we can we can work with this. Corey's OK. We can we can do something. And so when the surgeons came around to kind of explain how it went, I was just so unprepared for what they actually told me, which was awful. So the findings for Corey were that um, Corey's heart was quite badly damaged. Um, and they, I think they, the words they said to me, I, I'm quite, I think I must have blocked this out in some way, but they said that basically his, um, his heart was that of a transplanted heart, which would have been there for about 10 years, not two. Um, and there was a lot of meetings, a lot of meetings with me, a lot of meetings between the transplant teams, the surgeons, um, the cardiac specialists, um, and also Corey's feelings were taken into consideration. Now, Corey is 11 years old. He is able to make up his own mind. He's able to tell people his feelings, his wishes, what he wants. And that was right from having the second transplant. He said, if I ever, ever need another transplant, I would rather not be here than go through that again. And Corey maintained that. And when he fell poorly again this time, he said the same thing, that he does not ever want to go through all of the pain and all of the rehabilitation and the tracheostomies and anything else. He doesn't want to do it anymore. Um, he said that he spent his whole childhood fighting to stay alive. He's been through all of the surgeries, which were lots and lots of surgeries. And so the choice was made um, by all the professionals and taking Corey's wishes into consideration, which was to never ever go through this again to place him on palliative care which is obviously not giving it any more surgery not giving him the transplant that he needed because his body probably wouldn't have accepted it he possibly would have passed away in theatre which nobody wants so um Corey is now on palliative care at home which means that although he's receiving medical care he has a lot of medicines which um, I actually have here so I will show you now what Corey has to have in a day. Corey has two boxes for medications so he has one box which is, are his daily medicines which he has about 24 medications um, five times a day um, so that's in total not 24 each time but he has them so this is Corey's box of medicines which he has to have throughout the day. There are lots, um, he only has about 24 in total. And um, the last ones are about 10 o'clock at night. So he, it's pretty much um, a, a big thing for him. Uh, a lot of tablets, which he is now used to taking. Um, but he also has a secondary box, which we keep in the kitchen and not in my line of sight because I hate seeing it. And that's his end of life box. So this is his normal everyday one. His end of life box consists of morphine and midazolam and lots of other very strong drugs to stop him from being in pain and to keep him comfortable when that time is nearing. Now, to be told that your child is not going to survive is something that it's just horrendous. It's I can't even describe, sit here and describe to you I mean, I cried and I sobbed and I wouldn't believe it. And I was having none of it, absolutely none of it. They had to be wrong. Um, and it was just really difficult for me because I was on my own in hospital because COVID rules would only allow one parent in. Obviously, um, there's me and my, my husband. Um, and so I just found it really difficult. And I did not want Corey to know. That was the big thing for me is that I did not want anybody going in there and telling my son who was already traumatised that he was not going to survive. I had to be the one to do it, but I wasn't prepared to do it until he kind of twigged something was wrong and he asked me the question, which he did later on when we got home. So fast forwarding again, we get home with Corey. Um, he knows that he's not well. Um, he's quite swollen in his face. So Corey usually has a slender face. And if you notice, he has a little bald face. He says that his favourite word there, bald. But he has his face is quite round. Um, so he is retaining fluid. Um, he is on special tablets, which are diuretics called fruzamide, and they help him to kind of expel water. Um, he's on fluid restriction at the moment. So because he's in kidney failure as well, he can only have a certain amount of liquids per day, which for Corey is 1400 mils. 
um, any more than that and it can uh, um, overload his kidneys which can then put additional pressure on his heart which can then spiral which we don't want to happen so at the moment touch wood there's a big wooden chest down here touch wood Corey is managing pretty much okay how he's doing now so he's on his medications which maintain him he does get days where he's in pain he gets he gets days where he sits and sobs with pain and I have to go upstairs and massage his legs because his circulation's not good his feet are freezing um I wrap him up in blankets I massage his hands he has hand warmers hot water bottles extra blankets he has fluffy tops which you will notice in pretty much all of his videos he has on um he has several of them by the way it might look as though he's wearing the same clothes but he hasn't he wears super super soft teddy bear fleece clothes because he's covered in scars like he from literally everywhere on his torso is covered in scars so for Corey that's the most softest material and it's the most warmest material so he wears that quite a lot um so at the moment Corey fully understands what is going on he asked me the question um which was mummy am I going to die young and I think he pretty much twigged that when he started having counselling and um all the amount of drugs he was on because he'd gone from having hardly any to quite a lot so basically the stage we're at now is skipping out a lot of trauma and a lot of him crying and me crying and trying to comfort each other and we are at the point now where we're at home and Corey's comfortable and Corey knows he's going to pass away and I might look as though I'm cool and calm and collected on the surface, but believe me, I go off camera and I sob, I cry, I watch him sleep, I take videos of him breathing when he's asleep, and I check him five or six times a night, often, as a lot of you know, because you do text me at three or four or five o'clock in the morning, especially with the time zone differences as well between America and the UK or whatever, um, I'm often awake till five or six o'clock in the morning because I'm checking Corey all the time. Um, now we are in walkie-talkie contact, so if he's in his bedroom, we have a walkie-talkie each. Obviously it's pink because I'm a crap goth. Um, so if he is upstairs playing on his PS5, which by the way he loves, um, I can just have to radio up to him and know that he's okay. He's currently asleep as it's about one o'clock in the morning, so I'm not going to show you, otherwise I would. Um, but Corey is quite content. He understands what is going on. He understands he's going to pass away at some point. Now, we don't know when that's going to be. So for those people who are out there asking questions about do we know how it's going to happen, when it's going to happen? No, the answer is no, we don't know. It could be very sudden or it could be a deterioration. Um, but at the moment, we are living every single day, coping as best as we possibly can, given the situation at home. So I know that I've just skipped through quite a lot of years there. So 11 years of major surgeries, um, two heart transplants, um, and now we're in palliative care. Well, he's in palliative care. Um, so Corey's decision is to, when the time comes, um, is to pass at home with me and his big sister, Ebony, by his side. Um, he loves John, uh, my husband. He um, calls him dad. He loves Ostara. And he wants to be at home, but he wants to be with me and his big sister when that when that time comes. Now, oh, so our best case scenario would be that that he passes at home peacefully in my arms with his sister by his side, surrounded by his teddy bears in his bedroom peacefully not in any pain but we know that isn't potentially going to be how it happens and that he might need to go into a hospice and it might happen there in which case I will move into the hospice with him full time and I will be there by his side and I will not leave his side But this is the real side of what's happening. So Corey is really brave. He knows it's going to happen. And he is making crafts. And I will say that thank you to those people who are sending gifts from his Amazon, uh, his Amazon wish list, which are of crafts. Someone sent us, I can't remember who it was. They sent a lot of wooden hearts for Corey. 
and he's been sat upstairs today colouring those hearts in and he's going to do as many as possible and we are going to send them out across the world to people so um a lot of people have been supporting Corey and we will put them in the post and we will send them out um and he is going to be putting fingerprints onto the back of every single love heart um once he's coloured in the front so um when the time's right we will be doing those sending those out to people so if anybody does want to send him any love hearts um or anything that they would particularly like Corey to craft for him that is easily posted um then just feel free to pop onto his amazon wish list feel free to choose something off your own bag it can't be anything big it's got to be something small i can pop into an envelope because obviously you air mail to america australia greece wherever it would be expensive so um Corey loves doing crafts absolutely loves it it's what keeps him going um i'm probably waffling at this point now because i've just completely like <sighs> basically so we are focusing on the positives now so we don't know how long we have with Corey. Corey is our world as well as the other children my eldest daughter ebony and my little one ostara um you know children they're everything and so we are trying to make the most of what we've got so right now at this point in time um with your help um which is incredible we are setting up a studio a recording studio for corey and this all came because of youtube and wow what an incredible amazing journey this is being it's just something that no one could ever have predicted so the youtube journey started out as a make a wish so corey's wish was to um meet johnny depp or speak to johnny depp so he has been a huge huge pirates of the caribbean fan for as long as i can remember and not just Pirates of the Caribbean, but obviously Charlie and the Chocolate Pantry, Willy Wonka and that kind of, you know, he, he loves, absolutely loves Johnny Depp as an actor. Um, and he he just watched Pirates of the Caribbean on repeat, loop after loop. And I must admit, as much as, as I adore Pirates and as much as I am a massive fan of Johnny Depp myself, um, watching Pirates of the Caribbean film after film on repeat for six months, you kind of get to know all of the lines. It kind of drives you insane in a little while, but in a really positive way, because it was just pirate everything. So everything he did was revolves around pirates. So it, it was the obvious thing, really, um, when somebody said, why don't you apply to Make-A-Wish? So, um, and we were blessed enough that Make-A-Wish UK got in touch with Make-A-Wish America who managed to get in touch with Jason, um, who works with Johnny, and it all went from there, really. So it happened quite quickly, um, quite unexpectedly one day. And um, yeah, um, Johnny, Jack Sparrow, because he dressed up as Jack Sparrow, which was fantastic and an amazing surprise for Corey, rang Corey, um, video called with him, which was incredible. And Corey kind of froze. <laughs> I don't think he really knew what to say. Um, I was um, kind of nervous in the background filming not very well on the phone as you would see because I was shaking um I was a bit nervous um for him and I was kind of prompting him on kind of what to say because he kind of clammed up so for those who don't know Corey has autism um he's he's high functioning but he does have social anxiety when it comes to interacting with people especially when he's nervous so he kind of needs a prompt so you might see me every now and then whisper in his ear or give him a little nudge um and that's what it was like with Johnny um or Jack Sparrow, should I say. So that was an amazing experience. Um, obviously, you know, we are releasing the footage of that phone call as we, we get subscribers up, which is upon advice from, from, from Johnny's team to do that because it, it's, it's just a really good way of keeping Corey's interest in his channel and it's just nice for him. So not only that, but obviously Johnny didn't stop there. So um, he then went on to make off his own back a video for Corey's YouTube channel um which was a beautiful surprise to us um and we were allowed to put it onto his channel kind of getting his friends to sign up and advocating for Corey's channel which was amazing um and on the back of that Corey went from being a little boy who just wanted to talk to his favorite pirate and be a youtuber to suddenly becoming this huge <laughs> youtube star really overnight 
and um, it was unexpected. We are a quiet little family. Corey um, doesn't really speak to many people, so it was a huge shock and it has just been one of the most magical things that could have happened ever. Um, I think at this point, before all of this happened, I was so close to giving up um, mentally, physically. Corey was sitting in his room, not doing anything, not wanting to talk to anybody and just kind of retreating into himself. But this, this YouTube sensation, which is dream, which has happened, you know, on the back of not just Johnny Depp, who is an incredibly kind, amazing, compassionate person, but on the back of you all of you who have helped to promote his channel and share his things and you know and I'm, I could sit here and reel off all of the people who have been involved in this and I just would not have time um but I will thank every one of you because you have all given my son a new lease of life so here we are we are over 200,000 subscribers onto Corey's YouTube channel. Really trying to boost those numbers up. Corey has got his silver play button, which you would have seen in previous videos. Um, that in itself was such a big achievement. So it's something that I don't think he even thought he'd get 100 subscribers, let alone 100,000. So <laughs> it's incredible. And I know a lot of you are kind of, kind of saying, look, pirates need gold, go for gold. Obviously, a million subscribers for Corey's channel would be fantastic. Um, he is happy with his silver button. He's not a greedy child. Um, obviously, a gold play button would be a dream. Um, so we need people on board like Mr. Beast, um, who would obviously boost his numbers massively. But this channel is not just about unboxing and having fun. This video in particular, one of the things I wanted to highlight was transplantation so it's not an easy discussion to have with anybody whether it's an adult or a child um as a mum whose child has received two heart transplants and who i have lived in hospital with and seen countless children who are living on machines um, attached to machines walking around with mobile heart devices who are in hospital for not just a couple of weeks, but a couple of years at a time because they are not well enough to leave hospital. They are desperate for an organ. Now, this is not just hearts. Obviously, we've lived on cardiac units. There are people everywhere, children, adults who need um, lung transplants, kidneys, livers, hearts, you know, so many things that I can't even mention. And one of the things I really want to do with this video is to ask of you all to seriously consider um, donating not just your own organs but should you be in a position um, an awful horrendous position with your children or your loved ones where you are asked would you donate their organs in the most horrendous times of your life where you are grieving at the most I can't even describe the level of pain because I know that I'm going to go through it with Corey. He can't donate sadly because his organs are too damaged but if he could then I would definitely do it for him. Um, but please please consider the fact that when your loved one or yourself are no longer here that they can live on in somebody else and they can give that child um, or the adult an, a new lease of life and it's not just one life that you are changing. It is the lives of you, the family and the friends and and it's just such a massive, massive gift. I cannot kind of beg of you more to just um, consider having those talks with, with, with your family. Um, now, in the UK, we have an opt out system now um, of organ donation and I don't know what it is for the rest of the, the, rest of the world, but please, um, please just... It is the greatest gift, the literally the greatest gift is life. Um, and and you can actually give somebody that gift if you sit down and talk with your loved ones about organ donation. Nobody wants to think about losing their children. Now losing, I have lost my mum. I lost my mum in a road traffic accident um, several years ago and I thought that was the worst pain I would ever go through. 
and she wasn't a candidate unfortunately to donate her organs um and obviously my son now Corey um is also not in a position to do to, to kind of donate his I myself would give him my heart now I would give any part of my body to save my child if I could but he doesn't want to and obviously I can't just give him my heart but I could but I am on the donor list um I will give anything to anybody I will say um to those people who are facing losing especially this is this is about children now so as an adult you have that choice um you can choose to sign that register before anything happens to you um or you can talk with your loved ones about your wishes children don't have that option they are little they are relying on their parents or their carers to kind of make those decisions for them and it is not something that anybody wants to think about especially donating your child's heart now to me I can be honest and say this before having Corey had anything have happened to my eldest daughter Ebony if anything had happened to her and someone had said to me can we please have her heart for somebody else I can honestly say I would have said no before this because the heart is such a personal thing it's a lot of I know people believe the soul resides in the heart um but this whole experience with Corey totally took those blinkers off and really made me realise the absolute vital importance of this and that I would not hesitate in a heartbeat now um, to donate uh, my children's organs. Now, I never want that to become an issue. Obviously, nobody does. But having lived in hospital and seen all these children who are desperate for hearts, seeing their parents crying in the, you know, in the parents' accommodation because there's nothing that they can do and seeing the desperation of the nurses and the, the transplant staff and then seeing the absolute elation, the bittersweet elation of knowing that their child has been offered an organ um, when a donor is found is the most beautiful yet heart-wrenching thing ever and I remember the first and second time Corey was told or I was told that Corey could have a new heart and I knew that somebody would have to have passed away for Corey to be able to live so that is such a bittersweet thing and I know the family of Corey's first donor I'm not going to name them but I, but they know who they are I know who they are and they know that they will forever, forever have my gratitude and my love. I have a photo of their son in my hallway and that will stay there forever. Um, we don't know who the second donor was. Um, we, I've written to the family, um, but I will say that it is such a beautiful, selfless, incredible act. If you can pass on something to somebody else to give them a chance at life. Now, I have had four extra years going into the fifth year with Corey from his first transplant that I would never have had. And those five years, I have got married last year and Corey was my ring bearer. Um, we've been on holiday. We've had lots of lovely days out. We've had lots of experience with Corey. He started school. He went on his first school trip. He got himself a girlfriend, you know, and now look, he's an Internet sensation and he's met Johnny Depp all kind of on screen. And um, he has all of you supporting him. So I'm not going to ramble on for too much longer. But please, please, if you can give the gift of life, please do so. It will be the greatest, most selfless act that you can do for anybody. I'm going to finish this extremely long video now just of saying thank you. So thank you first and foremost to the incredible selfless acts from the donors families um, who helped save my little boy's life and gave me all these extra years with him. Thank you so, so much to the Newcastle Freeman team um, who have been and are always going to remain, no matter what happens, part of our family. Um, we love you. We absolutely could not have done any of this without you you have been our rock our support system you've been um shoulders to cry on you've picked me up when i've literally been on the floor sobbing and you've given us accommodation and and just amazing honestly and the surgeons and everything oh my gosh i cannot thank you all enough and to birmingham children's hospital and to leicester hospital for looking after corey 
and for everybody involved in Corey's care, whether it's giving us lifts to the hospital um, or coming over with hampers, gift hampers, sending messages and everything. And now my last words go to you. Every single one of you who are watching this channel and me right now on this video, which I know has been a long video, but thank you for your support, for your gifts for Corey and the rest of our family, for the beautiful messages, for not giving up on us, for following Corey's channel, giving him this new lease of life, which he now has because he is aiming towards gold. Silver is plaque, it's fantastic. Corey said to me he thought he'd fulfilled his wish list um, and that he didn't have anything else to kind of live for. So that's why we're kind of going for the gold now, because it gives him a really massive thing to aim for. Um, so thank you to everybody. And I would like to say an absolutely huge heartfelt thank you um, to obviously my husband who supports me and my children who have been amazing. And um, all my friends, I've got lots of good friends and an extra special mention to Coro. And this lady, who um, is Corey's manager, and we appointed her her manager, she laughs at that title, but that's what she basically is. She not only edits all of Corey's videos for him, um, she does it out of the goodness of her heart. She um, she is working her little butt off behind the scenes here, um, and she uploads his videos, edits his videos, talks to the big people at YouTube, um, talks with, via emails with American people and youtubers and she does so much for us um and she's such a lovely person and i haven't mentioned her in any of the other videos because she's quite shy um but a massive thank you sean to you you are an angel and um i will just finish off by saying thank you to everybody who is supporting Corey. please please talk to your families about organ donation um, don't make it a taboo subject. Don't leave it until the last minute. Um, consider saving somebody else's life. And thank you all from the bottom of my heart and from Corey's broken heart for giving Corey a new lease of life and for helping us to achieve his dream of becoming a YouTuber. So from me and a sleepy Captain Corey upstairs who will be back very soon with an unboxing video and a special video which we are recording um, in a couple of days. My love goes to all of you. Goodbye.